Well, hi there. I didn't see you there. Well, um, I guess you're probably hearing me listening to some airport traffic on um, my trusty little Yesu VX5 here, which I will actually talk a little bit about today. So in today's video, we're going to talk about how being a ham radio operator has made me a better drone pilot and also probably rekindled my interest in aviation. All coming up. Hi everybody, I am Ria and 2 rj and welcome to the channel. This is a channel where we talk about ham radio and other assorted radio hobbies, not just ham radio and everything in between. And you know, sometimes I do a little crossover with my other hobbies, which might include photography, drone photography, and other cool little things. So let's get to it. Today, um, we're going to talk about how ham radio basically intersects with aviation and aviation hobbies. And you know, I'm I'm kind of like on the on the periphery of aviation because I'm a drone pilot, and basically I sm I fly small unmanned aircraft. I have a couple drones, and the main one I use today is the DJI Mavic 2 Zoom, which is a small quadcopter made by DJI, and it's basically a flying camera. Now, um, of course, I've always had an interest in flying stuff and flying planes and, and stuff, and I, had a, I have a friend um, who lives in town, and he has a plane at the small airport, the Sussex airport in town. And um, I used to fly with him now and again, you know, and he actually let me take the controls a few times, which was pretty cool. And I always wanted to get my um, private pilot license, but, you know, between money and medical issues and stuff, um, yeah, it's been um, kind of tough. But maybe, you know, one day I'll probably fix both of them and um, get to fly my dream. So I know a lot of ham operators are also private pilots and some of them are actually airline transport pilots and stuff. And, um, they really enjoy aviation. So, but you know, in studying for the FAA part 107 test, which I had to take, I discovered that there was a lot of crossover in amateur radio. And because of that, it was substantially easier for me to pass and when I passed, I got 93% on the knowledge exam because it was just so easy for me. Uh, and, you know, and I'll, I'll talk about some specific areas where you as a ham radio operator are going to excel in this if you do decide to pursue this. So anyway, let's talk about drone regulations in the U.S. So in the U.S., you can fly under several different categories. You can fly either as a recreational user or a hobbyist where you are basically flying 100% for fun. You're not making any money or, you know, even if you're not making any money, you're not doing this in furtherance of a business. It's very important. You, you don't have to be making money, but, you know, it has to be, if it's in furtherance of a business, then forget it. You're not, you're no longer a hobbyist. There are a few YouTubers with millions of subscribers, some who say that how they're hobbyists, but I don't know. I mean, they've managed to escape the wrath of the FAA so far, whereas I've seen some other YouTubers basically get a nice little certified letter or a phone call saying, hey, you know, um, you operated the drone illegally without um, for commercial use without a certificate. I didn't want to be one of those people. So I actually do have a separate channel that I'm going to be putting all my drone stuff on, including a part 107 tutorial. And um, I will be putting information about that soon. But um, right now I'm just, um, you know, trying to, to build some of the, the content and, and such on there. All right. So how do you get a drone certificate in the United States? So there are basically three types of users. The first one of them, obviously, is a recreational user. And the recreational users are basically just that people who use their drones for strictly hobby use. They do not use it in furtherance of a business. Very important phrase. It's not that, that you have to make money, but if it's in furtherance of a business, then it becomes a commercial operation covered under the next category, 
I'm going to talk about afterward part 107. Then you have public COAs. So public COAs are basically government agencies that self-certify their drones and self-certify their operators. And they operate drones under that authority. And then finally, you have the part 107. And part 107 are commercial civil aviation drone users. So people who are not part of the government like they're not covered under public COA and they're not hobbyists because they're using their unmanned aircraft, small unmanned aircraft in furtherance of a business. Um, and it's again, it's not just making money. And with those, the 107, there are a wide variety of activities that will fall under part 107. A common example is doing commercial photography and commercial video videography, including YouTube. I mean, a monetized YouTube channel, you know, I'm pretty close to there. I'm over 900 subscribers now, probably getting to 1K, and I'll be able to, to monetize the channel. Um, I used to be monetized back in the day when the guidelines were looser, but then it kind of fell off because of the new guidelines, but hopefully it'll stick this time. So the part 107, what they do is they give you a 60-question knowledge test, and the 60-question knowledge test quizzes a lot of facets of aviation in general that are not just to do with drones. They tell you things like how to monitor aircraft traffic patterns, how to determine the direction of runways on the airports, things that you will never know, but you will probably need to know them to figure out which general direction aircraft are coming from. And here's an important one. They tell you about radio frequencies. So if you are operating near an airport, because you can operate near an airport, you can apply for permission to operate in that airspace through something called LANCE, which is the Low Altitude Authorization um, uh, something. <laughs> I'll put it in there. LANCE, L-A-A-N-C, um, Notification and Control System. That's it, yes. Low altitude authorization, notification and control, LANCE. You go basically on a website. You can go or a um, you go on a phone app. I use Kitty Hawk phone app. And then you map out your flight path. And then you click request permission. And then you it basically submits the info to the FAA. And the FAA then approves or denies your permission. And then you get to fly there. Of course, um, somehow it notifies the local control towers, the local airport control towers, that they will know that there are small unmanned aircraft in the area. Um, that's open to hobbyists and Part 107, by the way. The Part 107, however, there are certain areas where they will not automatically approve drone flights. And you still use the land system, but you apply for something called further coordination. That one is only available to Part 107 pilots. So I did it for that reason as well, because there are certain places. I have a friend who has an antenna tower, and he's right next to an airport. And um, I want to be able to take some pictures of his house to his towers and such and add them to my portfolio. So you not only have to register yourself, you have to register the drone. So anyway, so what do they quiz you on? Well, like I mentioned, the radio frequencies. Common aircraft radio frequencies they will quiz you on are the CTAF, the Common Traffic Advisory Frequency. Basically, that is the frequency that the all the airplanes near the airport will talk to each other, and also they'll talk to the control tower to basically... Learn how to, to negotiate how to stay out of each other's way and the control tower to direct traffic. So they call the tower on a CTAF frequency and the the aircraft will, they will direct the aircraft. So you have to know the CTAF frequency and learning, you know, learning about frequencies in general in amateur radio, you know, you know what a megahertz is, you know, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. It, it makes it a lot more comforting for you. The other thing is that aircraft communications are on AM. And 
if you have a radio, like my VX5 here that I was listening on earlier, you will be able to listen to the local airports and you'll be able to hear and get a feel of what the aircraft traffic is like. You don't have to go out and specifically buy an aviation radio. In fact, my other daily carry radio, which is the Kenwood D74, has AM aircraft band built in. So I'm able to monitor the aircraft frequencies as well. And I can not only hear, get a feel for their radio communications, and you know, get more comfortable with the, the material and the knowledge test, but I could also get, let, learn some real practical stuff. They talk about the runways, they talk about the traffic patterns and everything else. So that was really helpful. But you know what, it goes beyond radio. And radio is, is just one aspect of, of communications. You learn about, if, you, if you're a ham radio operator, a lot of ham radio operators take interest in the weather, particularly if you're like me and you're a certified Skywarn spotter. So a lot of ham radio operators are involved in what you call Skywarn, which is a volunteer um, service of the National Weather Service. They're basically volunteers who send in reports of weather and storms and such to the National Weather Service. And... A lot of them are ham radio operators because it's just easier to coordinate via radio and hams generally just like to learn about that kind of stuff like weather. So I learned about the weather. I learned about fronts. I learned about clouds, which they teach you in the Skywarn training, by the way, and other stuff and stable and unstable air and that kind of stuff. So I was really, you know, I was really comfortable with the material. Something else you learn. If you have ever played with directional antennas, with Yagi antennas, you will learn about directions. And when I mean directions, directions specified in degrees, like for example, your bearings. If you're, you learn that 180 degrees is south, 90 degrees is east, etc. Especially if you're a DXer like me and you work in DX and you have to do the beam headings in order to to talk to various parts of the world. Or even if you're a VHF person and you're aiming your antenna, you learn about all that stuff. So that's another area of crossover of knowledge. You know, and I mean, there is just so much, you know, I think there is just so much crossover between the hobbies. And well, not only just hobbies, but between the um, two different act types of activities. So I'm really happy. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad I passed the test and I'm hoping I could go further. Um, maybe I'll probably get some sort of pilot's license. Who knows? Maybe if the money comes around and also if I get the health issues addressed too. But um, we'll see how that goes. So um, that's uh, pretty good. Happy flying. And um, like I said, I really enjoy the dronography. And, oh, yeah, one other thing you learn, too, is about when your your drone doesn't perform properly or if, you know, what is the most common method of losing control? Obviously, it's radio interference. And you learn a lot about radio interference as a ham radio operator. So that is that is one important thing. All right. Thank you. This is a short one. I will see you guys around. I'm going to see um, how things go in the holiday season. I've been quite busy with um, getting ready all the preparations for Christmas and New Year's and such. Take care, everybody. 73 and 2RJ. Bye-bye now. Keep on hand.